Welcome. This is the Clearwater Bombers Sports Show, and I'm Bruce Kaufman. I'm Wayne Dees. And Wayne, we're here to discuss the Clearwater Bomber legacy in men's fast pitch softball. I believe we've worked all our way up to the 1980s. We have. 1980s, we're going to talk about today and some of the history of the 80s. You know, this is our effort to do a virtual museum while we're in the process of building an actual physical museum. And so we're trying to record some of the highlights of the Clearwater Bomber men's fast pitch legacy, which we've recorded uh, for the last few weeks. And in 1980, the world tour was in Decatur, Illinois, which was just uh, an hour or so away from my hometown of Greenville, Illinois. You familiar with that area? I'm sure familiar with that area. And uh, the interesting thing is the host team was Archer Danlin Midland, and they were from Decatur, Illinois, sponsored by the world's largest corn producer in the, in the world. Right. That was ADM, and they had ADM. put together a real, real good team. They had brought a lot of players in, give them jobs, and had just one, they had one of the best teams in the country. So, um, in hosting the World Tournament that's sponsored by the ASA, who won that year in 1980? Well, it was won by a team called Peterbilt. And remember, we talked about Seattle, Washington. Yes. Um, they kind of bounced around a couple of years, but they came up, somebody came up with Peterbilt as their sponsor. And you're going to hear their name through the 1980s a few times. Well, if I know the industry well enough, I think Peterbilt is a major 18-wheeler truck manufacturer. And uh, they were in Seattle, Washington, but we kind of noticed here the similar thing that happened several times to the Clearwater Bombers. You host the tournament, you hope to win, and you don't. And ADM didn't win the tournament that was being held in their home stadium that year, which I'm sure disappointed their fans quite a bit. How did the Bombers do that year? The Bombers finished sixth. Well, and that's not too bad, uh, considering how many fast-pitch teams were playing in the 1980s. Right, and they had, so you had some powerhouses, and the one guy on the Bombers that had a great tournament finishing sixth was Tommy Moore. Okay. And he, he was on the world tournament team at that tournament. And he was on that team as a second baseman. Second baseman. Which was pretty impressive. He um, was first was, team second base. That's pretty awesome. So um, we've heard the Moore name quite a bit uh, over the last few decades. And uh, Tommy is now playing for the Bombers and doing very well, obviously. Um, so in 1981, the tournament was held in St. Joseph, Missouri. Right. And Buck Speed had become the manager. And he took the team up there and they finished seventh. There's Buck. And we have a picture of Buck there on the screen. And they took seventh in that world tournament. Uh, but the interesting thing was that world tournament was won by ADM from Decatur, Illinois. <laughs> right, and that's what happens a lot of times. These teams, they host a team, or they host the world tournament, hoping that they can win in their town. Right. But I tell you, when back in those days, when it got down to the last five or six teams, you never knew who was going to win the tournament because right. they were all had right. great pitching and great players. You know, and, and the other thing is a lot of times people would travel um, to see the games, and they would come for hours and hours away from hometown just to see different people play, see the Bombers. I know uh, many times people would come just to the tournament because it was the closest the Bombers had got to them that year, and they wanted to see the Bombers play. Um, so we had, a, we had a pretty good following follow us through the tournaments. So the Bombers finished 6th in 80 and 7th in 1981, but in 1982, the World Tournament went to Midland, Michigan. Yep, it went down to Midland, Michigan. The Bombers lost in the regionals and did not qualify for the World Tournament, which was one of a very few times that that happened to the Bombers. Right. And uh, the tournament was then won by the team from Seattle, Washington, uh, sponsored by the Peterbilt Company. And uh, I'm sure that it was a well-attended tournament. Midland, Michigan has an excellent uh, support base, a lot of fans, a really good stadium. 
and uh, unfortunately we weren't there. But in 1983, there were a lot of new and uh, some old returning faces on the team. Right, the, we had players that were coming and going. Uh, there's Mitch Harder who was a veteran, and we had a fairly new player named Andy Marston. He was an outfielder and a good ball player from up around the Dunedin area. Well, Mitch was a local boy that had uh, done well, a pitcher. Um, he had gone and played for several other teams um, over the years, but he was back with the Bombers during the 1983 tournament. And it went to uh, Decatur, Illinois. And once again, Decatur um, has a good team, but they didn't win the tournament when no, they were the host team. This is another guy that had to wait his turn behind. Oh, that's right. He was behind Tommy Moore. Oh, Billy okay. Cooper, he was a second baseman. Yeah. And uh, finally, when Tommy retired, I think in 74, 75, then Billy got his chance and started playing uh, yeah. pretty regular as a, yeah. as a regular second baseman. But as you mentioned, the World Tournament was in Decatur. <clears throat> and it was won by the Cardinals, but they were no longer Robestos. Oh, my. Now they were West Haven, Connecticut. Okay. But, um, you know, a lot of times these teams, even though they change sponsors, they still have a lot of the same players over the years. Basically the same, and, yeah. But uh, one, one of the things about the Clearwater Bombers was after they became the Clearwater Bombers, they had been the Blackburn Bombers at the beginning for a few years, supported by the Blackburn family and the Blackburn Lumber Company. But once they became the Clearwater Bombers, they were the Clearwater Bombers. No matter how many sponsors they had, they always went by the Clearwater Bomber logo and name. So, I think about 55 years, because there was like only four or five years they were the Blackburn Bombers. Yeah. Well, they were the Blackburn Lumber Company for a couple of years and then became the Blackburn right. Bombers. But when they, 49 is when they became the Clearwater Bombers. And from then on, they were the Clearwater Bombers at all the world tournaments. Well, and, and the thing is, they started out as a Sunday night senior league local softball team. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a design, they weren't designed to win national championships, world tournaments. They were just a local Sunday night sports team. And over a couple years, just at the very beginning, a couple years, they became so successful at winning that all of a sudden everybody in the community started identifying with them as the top team in the area. And they become the comp. They basically became the tournament team for the Clearwater area. And as you mentioned before, almost every little town had fast pitch softball back then. That's, right. That's how the Bombers got started. It was a recreational type league. And if you remember the, the Bombers, the Blackburn Bombers was sponsored by an individual. Two or three of the other teams was sponsored actually by the city of Clearwater. Right, right. Um, so as we are going through uh, the history of the Bombers, you know, we're talking about men's fast pitch and it's softball. Um, so the softball is bigger than a normal baseball. Normal baseball is about nine inches in diameter, whereas the softball is somewhere between 11 and 12 inches in diameter. But uh, we were discussing uh, whether or not the softball is really soft if you get hit by it. At the, well, they used to have a court center in them. Everybody, our pitchers like the Dudley fast uh -huh. pitch softball, which was a white stitch ball. Right. And it was pretty hard in the beginning of the game. It would soften up a little bit as the game went on, but you could still hit the ball over the fence. You, it still had a pretty good, uh, if it thumped you, you know, if you got hit by a pitcher or a ground ball hit you, uh, you knew it. Yeah, and it usually left a bruise. Um, but a Bruce the, Bruce. Uh, yeah, <laughs> about the size of a grapefruit. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and the interesting thing is that that's probably the size of the softball is about the size of a good Florida grapefruit. Yeah, uh, that's it, pretty close to it. Yeah, you know, in, in talking about, uh, you know, the grapefruits and oranges, you know, baseball is about the size of a, an orange or a tangerine. Uh, the softball is about the size of a grapefruit. You know, the Al Rapetto family with the Orange Blossom Groves were sponsors of the Clearwater Bombers for many years. And, uh, you know, as a, as a kid growing up, I used to love coming to Florida on vacation with my parents from Illinois. And we, we would uh, go to all the different Orange Grove stands because they would offer you a free cup of orange juice 
or well, a little dinky orange ice cream cone. He was the very last to have an actual production plant where the fruit came in and they went down these big conveyors, they went through a washing tub, and then they came out again, and they actually went through a polisher. They used to put a little wax yeah. on those to polish them up. Right, and uh, you know, you could, you could go into their uh, warehouse uh, store, and you could uh, walk around and watch them cleaning the oranges and cleaning the grapefruits and boxing them up, and uh, there was just, it was just so much, uh, uh, when I Florida was, Americana. Yeah, when I was a kid, my mother worked at her summer job was packing fruit. At, we had a packing house in Palm Harbor, Florida, and it. Right. It, uh, she actually they produced and polished them and put them in bags and sold them. And uh, you know, those of us that came from the north during the winter time, we valued the Florida oranges and and grapefruits because it was very helpful for your. Y'all are the guys that bought them. Yeah. And so, hey, listen, we're going to go to a break and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jerry from Hot Locks Hair Salon. We are conveniently located at 13414 US Highway 19 in Hudson. I've been a local hairstylist in our community for the last 34 years, seven of which I was an educator. Our passion is the artistry of hair and Hot Locks is here to help you achieve your perfect image. You can call us at 727-514-9978. This is the Clearwater Bombers Sports Show, and we're talking about the Clearwater Bomber men's fast pitch softball legacy. And we are discussing the 1980s. Uh, Wayne, uh, in 1984, um, there was a manager that was uh, somebody that I think we have a picture of. But before we go to that, do we have a guess who section? Yeah, we do. We're going to try to tease you again with a player to see if you know who it is. And that section is called Guess Who? Let's see if you know who it is. Go ahead. Oh, 
1972, I was playing in Kansas City with a ball club up there, and we came down and uh, played the Bombers six game series over the 4th of July. And we played Bombers six games, played Candelary two games on a Sunday. And I can't remember, but I think it must have done something because in the last ball game we played against the Bombers, Bill Parker was man manager and coach in third, and he approached me about possibly coming down here in 73. And I, I had been to Florida a couple times, loved the hot weather and everything, and I told him I'd be more than happy to consider it. And in, I think it was November, December of 72, get a phone call from him, and he told me to pack my bags and head to Clearwater. And that's how I got down here, enjoyed it, loved every minute of it, great town, and the bomber organization was a first class organization. And uh, the funny thing about it was in 1968, I didn't even know what fast pitch softball was, but a guy up in Iowa approached me about playing fast pitch softball, and all I knew was a lob ball, and I told him I didn't want to play that, and he got me into playing he had a team of fast pitch and asked me to come out and well, watch him. And at that time, it was Steve Nielsen was pitching for his team up there, and I liked the looks of it. It was a good challenge. And five years later, I was playing for a national championship with the Bombers. So it was a big jump from in five years of not knowing what it was and playing for a national championship. Anything else? Well, we're back. So Wayne, uh, I kind of recognize the face there. I think I know him. Well, you should. He's one of our board members that trying to put the uh, <clears throat> museum in Clearwater and preserve the legacy of the Bombers. That's Jim Vitatech. He's and, a, he also handles our golf tournament registration and I, setting the foursomes up. I, I was going to say, you can meet Jim again at the uh, golf tournament. Um, so in 1984, Wayne, uh, we have a picture, picture number six here. Um, uh, I see a Wayne Dees over on the left side. Is that uh, you? Yeah, I had been the assistant coach with Buck Speed for a year or two, and Buck decided to give it up, so I took it up, and that's a couple of the players that we had on the team, uh, Sandy there and uh, Dan Nemi. Uh, I right. think we also have a picture of the team. And uh, you know, well, I, I I believe that year, I believe that year your coach was Richie Riles. Yes, I did have my assistant coach was Richie Riles. He was one of the old softball guys all over Dunedin, Clearwater, and he handles actually handles a lot of the umpires for the recreational leagues, the slow pitch leagues. For well, a while. you know, uh, I was very involved with the Bombers in the 1990s, and Richie Riles was one of the umpires that came regularly to umpire our games when we had teams from out of town. Uh, he was considered one of the best, and everybody in the industry respected him. But uh, obviously, he had some experience coaching and playing. Yeah, he managed the merchants, the Dunedin merchants, who uh, played against the Bombers a lot. Yes, and uh, he he had teams. I don't know for six eight years that the bombers played. Well, you know the interesting thing is uh, there were a few teams in the area that just loved to be the uh, designated opponent. And right, they, they would play the bombers, give the bombers practice, and a lot of the guys didn't necessarily want to go on the road and travel to the tournaments, but they were very happy to play against the bombers in local games. Right. This is the team that I managed in 1984, and uh, you have a list of some of the players there, if you sure. want to read some of the names. Nimi, um, Haley, yeah. Nipoti, Truluck, Courtney, Nall, Bollinger, Marston, Kane, Hazel, Brush, Perkins, Westmoreland, Vigil, Cavallero, Quinn. Uh, you know, we're, we're starting to hear some names that uh, are still around and still... Uh, have an impact on the game. Uh, the World Tournament was at St. Joseph, Missouri. Right. And uh, it was worn by Coors Kings from Merced, California. Right. The and most valuable player was Chuck Hamilton. Yeah, they, um, Gonella Brothers out of California, they had mm -hmm. kind of 
messed around and got new sponsors. But basically, that was the old Guinella Brothers team that had found a new sponsor, Coors Beer, which I think would be a pretty good sponsor. Right, I would think so too. You know, and the interesting thing is that these teams um, are basically local sports teams that are amateurs. But at the same time, it costs money to go to a tournament. It costs money to r rent rooms at a motel while you're there for a week to play in the tournament. I mean, yeah, if you're sponsoring one of these teams, uh, these players got to eat. Right. You know, they got to have a place to stay, a motel room. If they're in a world tournament, they start winning. They could be there a week, seven, eight, you know, ten days. Well, and I noticed the, the nice uniforms that were in the last picture that we had. It was color. And um, the uniform companies are usually the same uniform companies that are used by the professional sports teams. Yeah, when you get into the, this kind of thing, uh, you know, you got high quality uniforms because we played 130 something games. So that's a lot of wear and tear. The other thing is, a few years back in the 70s, we had convinced the Bombers to go with a blue jersey because I always thought that blue looked really good. Right. Well, it's red, white, and blue, uh, the American colors, and uh, that's good. The, the Bombers have been red, white, and blue for, uh, I think, ever since. Uh, in 1985, the World Tournament was in Salt Lake City, Utah. Right, and we still were picking up younger players. I have a, we have a picture there, number nine, of a guy we picked up from Pensacola, Florida. Uh -huh. His name was Steve Merchant. He's about 21 years old. Uh, it might have been the first time he was ever away from home for a long time. Yeah. But that's a picture of him hitting a home run. He was 21 years old. He had all the tools. He could run, hit, throw. I think we have a headshot of him next. And, uh, yeah, there's Steve. And he was with us a couple of years, and then he decided to go back and get closer to his family. Um, and most of these ball players are family men. And uh, they like to play close to home, if at all possible. Uh, this is an amateur sport. But um, they, the Bombers went to Salt Lake City, Utah, and finished 11th. That was my team as much as I hate to say that. But, uh, you know, we finished around 11th. We didn't do real good. Uh, you know, the MVP was a guy named Steve Newell from Seattle. And, and it was uh, won by the team that was called Pay and Pack. Pay and Pack. So, um, which was Peterbilt for a yeah. while, right? So, the the good players are are constantly out looking for good sponsors. So, in 1986, uh, Wayne, uh, the team once again uh, was competing in the world tournament, right in Seattle, Seattle, Washington, and uh, it was won by a team called Pay Impact. Now. Here's a guy named Wayne Vigil that had joined the Bombers. He used to play in Tampa, and he was probably one of the best fielding shortstops the Bombers ever had. Very soft hands, and he played for us long enough. He kind of got to be a veteran and a leader on the team, and that's basically what this article is saying, that he was now one of the leaders on the team for these younger players. And uh, I know Wayne very well, and he is an excellent player and a good role model for younger players. So uh, we were in Seattle, Washington, and Pay and Pack from Seattle, Washington won the tournament, and uh, their most valuable player was Stephen Carruthers. Yeah, Carruthers, Carruthers. Carruthers. And okay. uh, the team that finished second was a new team that kind of showed up on the block, a team called Pimcorp from Sioux Falls, Iowa. Very interesting. So, um, we're now starting to see some new players on the Bomber team, but we're also seeing some new opponents uh, that are starting to make appearances at the World Tournaments. Um, so in 1987, uh, the Bombers had a lot of new players, and uh, we've got a picture up here of uh, Tommy Cavallaro. Right, he was a catcher, and he could hit the long ball, a pretty strong guy, and you know he, they took a beating back there as a catcher. And then Mike Hazel uh, was a good hitter. Right, he was a Wiley veteran. He played the outfield for us. Right. And he actually ended up later on taking, I think, the Bombers down to Cuba. And they actually took a trip to Cuba and played the Cubans down there. And then uh, we've got Wayne Spanton. 
He, he was a fairly new player that we picked up from Tampa. Wayne pitched against the Bombers a lot with a couple of teams from Tampa. And he was a pitcher, left-handed guy that he moved the ball in and out. He didn't throw exceptionally hard, but he threw hard enough to strike you out if you weren't on your uh -huh. game as a hitter. Right. right. Well, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to come right back with uh, continuing coverage of the 1980 Clearwater Bomber men's fast pitch softball team. Hi, my name is Joe Staltieri. I'm one of the owners of Complete Care Systems. At Complete Care Systems, we do carpet cleaning, upholstery cleaning, tile and grout cleaning, tile and grout sealing, wood floor and laminate floor deep cleaning, as well as stripping and waxing of linoleum and vinyl floors and a whole lot more. We also run daily deals and special, which you can find at CompleteCareSystems.com or simply call Trisha up at 727-364. 5158 and she'll answer all your questions and give you over the phone free estimates or she'll send me out to your home or office to give you an on-site free estimate. At Complete Care Systems, we don't cut corners, we clean them. Hi, I'm Jerry from Hot Locks Hair Salon. We are conveniently located at 13414 US Highway 19 in Hudson. I've been a local hairstylist in our community for the last 34 years, seven of which I was an educator. Our passion is the artistry of hair and Hot Locks is here to help you achieve your perfect image. You can call us at 727-514-9978. So Wayne, we're in 1987 and we've got some more pictures of some of the players on that team and uh, we're discussing some of the new players and some of the new names. And this is Andy Knoll. Um, I think he's a local. Right, he's a local boy from Clearwater. He, their family owns the Knoll Lumber Company and he was an outfielder, big strong guy. Well, you know, the interesting thing is some of those outfielders could uh, field the ball and throw it all the way to home plate. They could. Here's another outfielder that we had, uh, Bobby Napote. Uh, I, think, I don't think he's from here originally, but I know he lived in Largo. And uh, he was an outfielder that came and stayed with the Bombers quite a few years, eight or nine years. So the world tournament that year was in uh, Springfield, Missouri, but let, let's go back. I think we have one more picture here. We've got Frank Chip Cunnan. Yeah, this you know Chip. Uh, Chip yeah. was a catcher. He was a local product from Clearwater Central Catholic. He was like an all-star athlete out there, and uh, I think a pretty good football quarterback, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think you're right, and you know the interesting thing is a lot of these bomber softball players, as we've talked in previous episodes, were good athletes in other areas, such as baseball, like you, and uh, some were good in football, some were good in basketball. Well, and to, to play fast pitch softball, you got to be a pretty good athlete because uh, everything happens, like as we've talked about before, much faster. You know, right. three tenths of a second faster right. than baseball. And, uh, and you, you know, know and it, it might not seem like a lot, but when you have just that short little window, 25% of that window being gone is a major difference. 
Oh, yeah. I, I always liked it because you played so close that you either caught the ball or it went by you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, the, so anyway, the World Tournament was in Springfield, Missouri that year, and uh, we have a familiar name that was the winner. Yep, Pan Pack from Seattle, Washington. Came back and... Like I said, they had put together a super team, and they had become one of the best in the country. And uh, I, I noticed another name that had come in second, Penn Court. From Sioux Falls, Iowa. And so, uh, so anyway, uh, in 1988, uh, when the pitchers were only 46 feet away from home plate. Well, there was a night in 1988 that it wasn't a good night for pitchers. And... Uh, if we get the picture up there, they were playing um, <clears throat> the Florida Crackers. Okay. And their pitcher took a bad hop. And uh, that's pick 16. He took a bad hop, and it hit him in the mouth. And he took five stitches. Time all was said and done. Wow. So, that's a lot of stitches for all right. taking a hit. Yeah. And then an inning and a half later, our pitcher, Mitch Harder, was pitching. And he took a line drive off the shoulder blade Ooh. and knocked him down for, you know, a minute or two till he recouped. Here you see the top pitcher is the guy from the Florida Crackers getting nailed. Uh -huh. And then the bottom pitcher is Mitch Harder when he got nailed in the collarbone. And the funny thing about this whole deal was they had come out with a new, what they called a solid core softball. Uh -huh. And I don't remember if the sporting goods store pushed them on us to try them or whatever, but we tried them and they jump off the bat so much quicker. And these guys got thumped by the ball. We found out later that the ball was illegal and not approved by the Amateur Softball Association. Well, and that's probably one reason why it wasn't approved by the Amateur Softball Association. Um, it was, like you said, it was new technology. They were trying something new, you know, and when I was in charge of the Clearwater Bombers in the 90s, all of the players, many of whom um, we've seen pictures of tonight that were on the teams that I was in charge of, insisted that I buy the Dudley White Stitch yeah. softballs, and that's the only thing they wanted to play with. And there's one other weird incident about that night that both pitchers got nailed. And yeah, what was that? We had a trainer named Leon Crane. Yeah, I remember Leon. And, He's been uh, around for a few he, years. He had taken a personal night off because he sat in the dugout all those games, never got a chance to work on anybody or take care of any problems. The one night he takes off, both pitchers get nailed. There's Leon right there. Oh. And uh, so and we know, teased him about that. And I know Leon, and he, he wished that had never happened on his night off. Uh, but... Uh, Anyway, that's just an interesting twist to the story. You know, we talked about, too, those pitchers are only 46 feet from home plate. Yeah, you don't have a lot of time to react to a ball coming off the bat. Uh, you and, know, and, and that solid core ball. In fact, they outlawed, slow pitch came out with it, Worth. They called it yeah. a Worth blue dot. Uh -huh. And the big boys were hitting it so hard and hurting pitchers and third basemen that the slow pitch outlawed that ball. Well, you know, the interesting thing was softball got started in a factory, kind of out of boredom, and it was a uh, balled-up boxing glove. That was the start of it. And then they had a 16-inch diameter um, ball that they used, and even now... Yeah, that, I think they call that a puff ball. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the names for it. Uh, you know, they, they use the term kitten ball as well. Um, but the softball kind of shrunk, at least for the teams that played outdoors, and it now is the size of a grapefruit, just like that, and the pitcher would hold it in his hand, and he had to have both feet on the mound, is that correct? He had to have one foot in contact with the rubber when he made his pitch. A lot of guys, uh, you're gonna hear a name here in a few minutes, that was what they called jumpers. Uh -huh. And he would put his foot on the rubber when he wound up. He actually would jump towards home plate. And time he landed, he was four or five feet right. closer to home plate. But And I think you heard the story earlier on one of our shows about Bobby Quinn. He would slide his foot a lot. Mm -hmm. And the teams would always right. complain that he was throwing an illegal pitch. His foot 
wasn't in contact with the rubber. So uh, we're in 1988, and the tournament was at Midland, Michigan. No, excuse me, Bloomington, Illinois. And it was won by Tran Air Vans from Indiana. Yep. Uh, the second team was a new team that we haven't talked about yet, but I know uh, we've played against them. The Farm Tavern, Madison, Wisconsin. And the MVP of the tournament was a guy named Peter Meredith. And I actually, one year, the year that we did not make the world tournament, uh -huh. that year that we got beat in the regionals, right. uh, Richie Riles and myself flew to Allentown, Pennsylvania, is where the tournament was. Okay. And we actually, I tried to contact Peter Meredith because at the time he was one of the best pitchers in the country. We were trying to get him to come to Clearwater. Uh, his manager didn't let him out of his sight very much. <laughs> so, you know, it was pretty hard to talk to him because everybody was going after these major pitchers. But he was a jumper. He would end up five feet closer to home plate when he let go of the ball. You know, I've watched some of the college ladies fast pitch, and I think there's several fast pitch, girls fast pitchers that do the jumping too because they seem to like they're hopping off that mound as they're delivering the ball. That's a pretty common pitch today, and... I guess they can get away with it as long as that foot's in the rubber when they bring that arm around. That's right. Uh, but Peter, he used to almost hit the ground before uh -huh. the pitch left his hand. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh, we're, the second place team that year was the Decatur Pride from Decatur, Illinois. And the most valuable player was Bill Boyer. Um, so... Right, and you notice Decatur now has become the Decatur Pride. I think they lost their sponsorship from ADM, uh -huh. so now they're calling themselves the Decatur Pride, whether they went under like a merchant situation, just went out and got sponsors to give them individual amounts of money or not, I don't know. Yeah, that was the 1989 World Tournament in Midland, Michigan. Uh, actually, uh, it was won by Penn Corp from Sioux Falls, and um, second place was Decatur Pride from Illinois. But... Um, as we are going through the 1980s, we have basically talked about the teams going through some transitions. We're getting some new players. We're getting some new blood. Some of the older players are starting to retire. Um, and it's becoming, I think, more competitive nationwide. Was, well, there always was that nucleus of six, eight teams that we talked about that were the best in the country. And they usually had the best pitchers. Right. Um, you know, we talked about Ty Stofflett, right. guy named Sterkel way back in the 50s, and so forth. But that's what you needed. You needed a couple of good pitchers, and you could become a powerhouse. But it's funny how things changed. You notice we moved around the country, right. and we're moving a little more out west now. Right. Right. Uh, there was a California team. The Seattle team won two, three years in a row. Sioux Falls. Uh, we, you know, we've Washington. Got, yep. We've got the Sioux Falls team uh, coming in here. We, go, of course, we, we've, we've still got the Midwest. Um, you know, very strong representation and also hosting. Um, you know, the interesting thing is the middle of the country uh, is a little bit easier to hold a tournament because a lot of the teams could drive to the tournament instead of flying. Uh, and yet the Clearwater Bombers, the Clearwater Bombers have hosted it in Clearwater more than any other place in the country. Even though we see some trends here like Midland, Michigan or Decatur, or St. Uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, things like that for a year or two. Uh, they trade it back and forth. But the World Tournament must have been a good for the economy because if you notice some of these same teams, Springfield, Midland, Michigan, right. it might have been a big income for their recreation department and bringing teams in, helping with sponsors for their right. teams. But the 1980s, interest began to wane right. on the uh, bombers. Right. The, they water. started losing ground a little bit in attendance and so forth. Well, and I think there was more effort being put into um, courting the Philadelphia Phillies in the spring training and then having the uh, Clearwater Philly team, which was the minor league team for the Clearwater. And I know, uh, you know, Jack Russell Stadium was being used both for fast pitch softball and also for 
minor league baseball or spring training for the major league team. Yes. Um, also this week, Bruce, I had a chance to go out to the Palm Harbor Little League, and we got a little piece on some of their players. And Right after a break, we're going to go. All right. That. Good? All right. I'm Jerry from Hot Locks Hair Salon. We are conveniently located at 13414 US Highway 19 in Hudson. I've been a local hairstylist in our community for the last 34 years, seven of which I was an educator. Our passion is the artistry of hair, and Hot Locks is here to help you achieve your perfect image. You can call us at 727-514-9978. So Wayne, this is the Clearwater Bomber Sports Show, and we're wanting to talk about the Clearwater Bomber men's fast pitch softball legacy. We've talked through the 1980s and talked about some of the new players that are coming on and some of the tournaments that we've attended, but um, there's always room for other players, and one of the things that have, we've done over the years is to try to help the local amateur sports children's programs, uh, the youth programs, and um, you've been visiting a few places. Uh, yeah, I visited the Palm Harbor Little League uh, Good. Uh, this week and got a chance to interview some of the f future bombers if we still had the bombers going. Well, we're going to get the bombers going again, Wayne. I'll just keep telling you and keep prophesying that we're going to get them back, but uh, we're probably going to be taking these young men from the Little League program to play fast pitch softball. We got some very interesting ball players. Well, do you have a video for us? Yes, I do. Everybody's up there. Yeah. Get in there. Get strong. Get sure of yourself. I'm still watching you guys up there with the happy feet. Pulling out, stepping out, and swinging. When the ball's in the catcher, get in there. 
when he when he releases and separates, that's when you guys are loading. Okay? Get in there and be ready to hit the ball. Every one of you guys can do it. You did it in one. Hey, be ready, I think. Be ready for it right here. Come on. You're up, you're up, you're up. Go two, go two, go two! I know. Shake it off. Shake it off. I mean, Hey, one of the fans out of the Little League ballpark, Palm Harbor Little League. What team you rooting for today, and what player? Uh, the Dunedin Blue Jays for Palm Harbor, and Ty Tipton, number 33. Hey, I caught one of the players off the Blue Jays. Hey, what's your name, what team you play for, and how do you do today? Uh, my name is Ty Tipton. I play for the Blue Jays, and um, I did pretty good. Uh, I was the catcher today for the Blue Jays. Um, I got somebody out at first, and um, I hit a double and got out twice. Blue Jays. Blue Jays. Remember, you gotta leave a foot in the box for that time. Hey, you guys are out here today watching the Palm Harbor Little League. What? Give me your names. Penny Padgett. I'm Chuck Padgett. And what team are you rooting for and what player? We're rooting for the Blue Jays, number 17, Brandon Dees. Yeah, I'm pulling for Brandon Dees. <laughs> Even though he's related to Wayne Dees, I'm still pulling for Brandon Dees. He's going. He went right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One. Hey Brandon, what's your name? What team do you play for and how'd you do today? Uh, yeah. <laughs> my name is Brandon Dees and uh, I play for the Blue Jays of Palm Over Little League and today it's my first home run and I pitch good and I made good points. All right, yep. uh, my name is Sean Tipton, coach of Palm Harbor Blue Jays, assistant coach. Uh, fortunately, we lost today. Second game, that's it. First week down, got a little bit of tweaking to do. Uh, got some kids that are hitting their ball well, they're seeing the ball. Some we're going to work on. Uh, stupid, silly little errors. We just got to gotta, uh, fix and capitalize on that, and we'll start winning some games. Good group of kids playing well together and all that. Hi, my name is Dave Patrick, coach of the Blue Jays. It's my son Jay right there. Played a good game today. Fortunately, we lost eight to three, but I think we're on the on the road to a good season. You ladies out watching the ball game today at the Palm Harbor Little League. What team and what player? Give me your names and what team, what player are you rooting for? My name is Candace Byrne, and I'm rooting for the Phillies. And I'm rooting for Aiden Byrne. I don't even know his number. I think he's eight. Oh, he is number. Nine. Nine. Number nine, Aiden Byrne. How about you? 
I'm Jillian. Um, I'm rooting for the Phillies, and I'm going for number one and number ten, which is Nathan and Ethan Langley. My name is um, Ethan Langley. I play for the Phillies, and um, we t we took the um win today three eight to three by um, stop. <laughs> we took the win by eight to three today. I pitched for two innings. I pitched like 40 pitches, and then they had like two runs score off of me, and then I catch for the rest of the game. And our team did pretty good. Batting we could work on, but defense we did really good on. And, um, yeah. Hey, we got one of the players off the, are you the Phillies or the Threshers? Tell us what team you play for, your name, and how you did today. Um, I play for the Phillies. My name is Nathan Langley. Um, today I pitched and I got no run scored on me. Hey, I found some fans out at the Palm Harbor Little League today. What's you guys' names? Gary. Gary Field. What team are you rooting for? Palm Harbor Yankees. Palm Harbor Yankees. And do you have a favorite player? Oh, yes, Kobe Murray. My grandson, Kobe Murray. And what number is he? Number seven. Hey, I got one of the players out of the game today. What's your name? Kobe Murray. What positions did you play, Kobe? Catcher in center field. How'd you do batting? Good. What position do you like to play? Catcher. We're back. This is the Clearwater Bombers Sports Show, and Wayne, we have a golf tournament to raise money for the Clearwater Bomber Museum. When is that going to be? We do. We're coming up on May 19th at the Wentworth Country Club in Tarpon Springs, Florida. And there's flyers all over Clearwater. Uh, there's pro we're probably going to be able to put a phone number up here that you can call in just a minute. Um, so you can call that phone number to get registered. There they are right there, either one of those numbers. And our guess who today, Jim Vitatech, is the one that's going to take you and put you with the teams and schedule everything. Right, and everybody that comes always has an absolutely great time. It's going to be at Wentworth this year, and uh, we're looking forward to having a packed-out roster. We have a number, just we have a boatload of prizes that we give away, door prizes, and usually everybody goes home with something. All right. So um, you can check out our website, www.clearwaterbombersinc.com, and uh, we're looking for sponsors for this show. We do need sponsors. It costs us, and uh, if you're interested, the phone numbers that was previously up on the screen, give us a call. Uh, if you like the show and you want to see the show continue and you have anybody that might be interested in sponsoring, please, please let us know. Any one of the board members on the Legacy Group, or myself or Bruce. Or you can send me a check for membership in the Clearwater Bomber Fan Club. It's $25 per person, $50 for a couple or a family, and $100 for a corporation. We'd love to have you. The website is there. The address is on our website, and you can get that information there. If you want to volunteer to help with us on the museum, you can. Uh, this is Bruce Kaufman. I'm Wayne Dees. And this is the Clearwater Bombers Sports Show. Thank you for watching and have a good week.
Hi, I'm Bruce Kaufman, CEO of Sunrose, the Bible educational game company, and co-game creator of the board game Jubilee. Jubilee is a fun six-directional spelling crossword game about Bible information. Each Jubilee card asks you to spell something from the Bible on the Space Age crossword board. In Jubilee, you don't need to know the answers. You can look up the answers. In Jubilee, you can draw any letters that you need. You can play 11 different games with the Jubilee game board. Visit our website, sunrosegames.com, and order your Jubilee game now.